Hello and welcome to Budget 101. It's that time of the year when typically everyone in Delhi, the media fraternity, all go into a frenzy just ahead of the annual union budget. So what we are going to do in this show is really break it down for you, try and explain to you what the union budget is about, what the various elements of the union budget are, break down some of the jargon that is typically thrown at you, make the union budget or understanding the union budget a lot more simpler for you. And there's no one better, do, better to do that for us than uh, Swami Nathan S. Ankleshwarya Ayer, who is consulting editor at the Economic Times. Now, Swami, I'm going to begin with asking you to break down the union budget for us. What is it about? Why do we need to do it? And what does it mean for the markets, for the economy? Well, it's no different from that of a housewife who says there is a certain amount of money coming in. I have to plan how much do I spend, where do I spend it, how much do I save, Perhaps I have to borrow for some things. All the decisions, therefore, that the housewife takes is exactly what the government has to take. The government also just has a kind of income in the form of tax revenue. It may think of as innovative ways of non-tax income like you sell your shares. Like the housewife perhaps will sell some gold. Very rarely, but, but, but maybe. And again, on the capital side, you may do some borrowing. Especially if you say, I am doing a capital investment. You say, I'm going to buy a flat. For that, you take a loan. So uh, you use that and for investment. So you decide, first of all, on your income, sources of income. Then what are you going to spend it on? How much, a housewife will say, how much goes on food, how much goes on clothing, how much on entertainment, transport, and can I best spare something for a holiday or for buying a mink coat? Similarly, the government has to have its own priorities. Uh, so on a much larger scale, Mr. Prana Mukherjee has to do what every housewife is doing. Sure, but why should I as an individual be concerned about the budget at all? You should be concerned because you are part. I mean, Mr. Mukherjee has no money except that which he takes out of your pocket and my pocket, right? So you should be interested because it's not Mr. Mukherjee's money. It's our money, your money that's going to come. Again, when he's spending it, he's spending our money. And then you have to spend, whom is he spending it on? He's supposed to be spending it on us. So then the question arises, what is it that we, that us, should be desiring that money be spent on? That's why it matters. Right. Now, within the budget, what are the primary sources of revenue for the government and what are the primary expenses that the government incurs from that money it raises? Well, the main source of income, obviously, is taxation. Right? The government doesn't actually earn money. There's a certain dividend it might get from public sector undertakings. That's a relatively small sum. Most of it comes from taxes. Increasingly, it's coming from direct taxes, income tax and corporate tax. And it also gets some money for indirect taxes like uh, excess duty, uh, import duty, in the case of state governments, sales tax. So these are the main sources of revenue. Over and above this, as I said, you might sell some things, like the government just tried to sell some ONGC shares the other day. Uh, you might be able to spell some, sell some spectrum. I think there's a substantial scope. If both 4G and 2G are sold in the coming year, maybe you can raise quite a lot of money out there. So these are the different forms of your getting income. As for what you spend it on, some things are fixed. One is, for instance, on all your past debt. You have to pay a certain amount of interest and repay those loans. That's fixed. Salaries. In other countries, you can sack guys. So salaries are not necessarily fixed. In India, I'm afraid, the culture is that you don't sack anybody. So that is taken to be fixed. Over and above that, there are certain schemes which are continuing schemes which you can't abolish. Whether it's an employment scheme like Narega, whether it's Service Siksha, Abhiyan. So there are various spending programs. On most of this, those things we already know. And I would say the balance of 10%, there is perhaps some flexibility on what the government can do in terms of new ideas. Over and above this kind of spending, which we call revenue spending, there is capital spending, which will go towards long-term investment. If I'm putting up national highways, it would be capital investment. If I'm putting up some major ports, uh, any of that kind of capital stuff. And finally, there is the defense component. That's a special component. Uh, again, there's some discretion in it, but by and large, it's fixed. Sure, I was speaking to somebody the other day who doesn't really understand the workings of the budget, and he said, you know, for a country or for a government that earns so many lakhs of crores by way through different sources of revenue, why does it still need to go out into the market and borrow? So why does a government come into market and borrow money? 
you could ask the question equally of mr tata and birla saying you have so much money why do you borrow and the answer is that it makes sense to borrow provided you borrow and invest in something which gives you a return which is higher than the rate of interest in the case of uh, mr micawber in charles rickens as he says you know pro provided the rate of return is even 0.1% higher than the rate of interest the more you borrow the more money you make now mr birla and tata are commercial undertaking so they would be looking at a narrow commercial rate of return a government would be looking at what they call a social rate of return it might well be for instance that when i invest in a road i don't get an income from the road but there is so much new economic activity along the road that those fellows start paying sales tax they start paying income tax they start paying corporate tax and i, I will get it back at the end of it all if any government is falling short on its tax revenue very often one reason is that that investment has been very poor very inefficient or it's so leaky you don't collect taxes but in most cases good sensible spending after borrowing will get the money back through the tax angle now swami typically when a government raises money through so many sources like you did mention taxes and maybe selling some of selling certain government assets as a taxpayer you'd ideally like to see a good amount of that money spent on utilities and benefits to the taxpayer itself that hasn't been happening now corruption is one of the angles that everyone talks of but why is it that the money raised through taxes and from the taxpayer isn't coming back or, or rather doesn't come back in a meaningful manner by way of amenities for for pe people in the country well this boils down to what you think you want to spend on if increasingly the government is spending on subsidies or it's spending on what do you call non investment things like shall we say more and more employment programs now the employment program in theory is supposed to create durable assets in practice that doesn't happen you're basically giving money away in various forms of welfare so it is desirable to give money away in in the form of certain amount of welfare provided it's properly targeted it goes to the appropriate number of people but uh, if things are not reaching the people then it boils down to what is your delivery apparatus here i'm afraid the central government has to depend on the state governments because the central government doesn't have central government officers everywhere right 95% of indians have never seen a central government officer they only see state government so you give the money to the states and some states make quite good use of it and others are absolutely dreadful so there's only so much that the government can do and beyond that the question is how well is it implemented the other thing is what is the mix of putting it in proper investment which gives you a long term rate of return there used to be a time when a quite a big chunk of the budget used to go into investment of various kind so if you built more roads more more power stations more ports uh, many of these other things it would benefit the entire economy and flow back to you in the form of higher taxes the way we are going if you spend more and more of it in subsidies more and more of it on welfare schemes well you are not going to get any returns out there and that does mean that there is less coming back to you right so this on that related note the term discretionary expenditure and non discretionary expenditure how would you differentiate between the two oh this is largely a matter of custom these things are helped you know it's impossible to touch this although in a crisis you suddenly find that you know the impossible becomes the possible but generally within a political system certain things are sacred salaries in india are sacred dearness allowance is sacred pensions are sacred defense is sacred and you can't really cut them very much uh, you by and large you can't even touch them interest that you have to pay on your bonds you can't default it has to go back it's all very well for a farmer to default but a government can't default so all those are regarded as fixed spending then what is left over tends to be quite a small part uh, that is called discretionary in so far as you can decide how much of this to spend if you see a budget statement a lot of what is called discretionary is completely bogus i mean you will take five schemes from the past years put them into a new one and say i got this new scheme of 10000 crores and actually the new money may be zero the, they do it again and again and again they reshuffle things under a particular thing there are some people who tell you that in fact there are sometimes as many as 48 different programs for one single sector like dryland farming
and is constantly juggled around in various ways and politically presented as new programs when it, it, it isn't really the case. But uh, at the end of it all, and you will find this more true of a state government, central government, you will find a state government that has directed its spending well. It has fast growth and does well. At the end of it all, the central government does not produce growth. Central government produces a certain framework. Then the actual implementation is, much of it is done by the state governments. And the reason why India got to 9% growth was that every state began to grow faster. It is not as the center did Chuvantar, we got fast growth. No, it was the work done at the state government level that trickled up and gave us 9% growth. Right, so when you talk about discretionary and non-discretionary expenditure, would you say that the big worry for a country like India is the fact that non-discretionary expenditure, the component, is gradually beginning to increase, leaving very little money with the government to invest on productive assets? No, look, there's two, the, as far as production is concerned, uh, the entire thing is, dis that, that's quite a large discussion. You see, you can always borrow more to invest more. You may choose not to do it. This, this, this becomes a matter of politics. Are you going to have government as an actual investor and deliverer, or are you going to have government as a facilitator? In the old days, Nehru's days, he says government must occupy the commanding heights, in which case the new government itself was spending a lot. Now we say, no, we have liberalized economy. The government will facilitate you guys. Both approaches have something to them, but certainly in the second case, there is much less that the government needs to spend. So the truth is that it is not necessary to spend very large sums of money. A well-directed policy is worth 10,000 crores of spending. All right, now the other terms, or rather two terms that are very constantly used, and I think this, with this year's budget, it's been even more often used, fiscal consolidation, fiscal deficit. If you could break those two terms down for our viewers. If I am spending more than I am earning, I have a deficit. That is for me is my own fiscal deficit. If the government is spending more than it's earning, it has a fiscal deficit. Now, if I have a deficit, who is financing it? In the case of government, it borrows the money. In my case also, if I have a large, large gap between what I spend and what I earn, very often it's borrowed. I may owe it in some way, in an informal sense, personally. Government, in a formal sense, will raise bonds or t treasury uh, securities with the RBI. So a fiscal deficit is nothing more than government borrowing to bridge the gap between what it earns and what it spends. Uh, the word fiscal consolidation, it's a euphemism of saying, you know, how do I tighten the screws? to bring down the deficit. It's very enjoyable, as you and I know, to live beyond our means. I mean, it's much nicer than just to live within our means. And if we then have to squeeze that spending, I mean, that's a bit of a killjoy. So instead of just sort of saying, I'm going to put a squeeze on you, we say, this is fiscal consolidation. So you're going to reduce the fiscal deficit. Right, and again, in every finance minister's speech, the term FRBM is constantly used. And related to fiscal consolidation, of course, but FRBM, if you could again break that down for our viewers. FRBM means Fiscal Responsibility and Budget Management. Long years ago, we made a tryst with a 3% deficit. <laughs> uh, at that Half time, the that deficits day. were very, very high, 8-9%, and they say, okay, let us commit to the government on a basis of 10 years that we will steadily bring it down, bring it down to 3%. And every year, the finance minister would make a check and say, I have made this much progress, and you know, I haven't quite got back on the target, but I'll try to get on the target. So this became, shall we say, a politically accepted practice. It need not have. After all, I have seen so many initiatives where the government promises to do something which is very good and then doesn't do it at all, and the whole thing is abandoned. But here, finance minister after finance minister decided to stick to this. And they managed to do it in the state governments also. Because as far as the state's governments were concerned, they were told, look, you guys have this huge debt to the central government. Provided you also make an FRBM Act yourself and you bring down your fiscal deficits, we will give you a certain amount of debt write-off. We'll muff all your old debts. So all the state governments enacted this thing and brought down their debts. And when the state governments were doing it, I think, Sharam ki baat hai. I mean, the central government obviously had to continue and do the same thing too. So this is a self-imposed discipline and more or less it has worked. 
Right now, again, another term often used: capital budget, revenue budget. How would we differentiate between the two? Generally speaking, if if I am uh, spending on food, if I am spending on uh, transport and entertainment, all this I would call revenue spending. Suppose I purchased an air conditioner, or I purchased a car, or I bought a farm. All this would typically be called capital spending because this is heavy expenditure on something that is going to benefit me in the long run. The car is a long term thing. I mean, it will continue to give me benefits for its life. Similarly, with the air conditioner. Whereas, if I eat, I mean, it's gone. So basically, it's it's between that which is consumed immediately and that which continues to give you benefits over a long period. 